So welcome everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about hatching in whipworms and this is a really cool interaction between the host, so um, in my case people, pigs and mice, the parasite which is whipworms and the microbiome which is all of the bacteria that are in our guts. Um, as a kind of brief overview of what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm going to be talking a bit about my career journey so far, kind of the steps that I took to end up where I am today, some of the different projects I've done and the skills I've learned along the way. And then we're gonna get into some parasitology, have an introduction to trichuris, uh, which is the Latin name for whipworms. Then we're gonna talk about my research into trichuris and we'll have a Q and A. Um, as we go along, we've got a little, um, a few different things. Um, we've got some true or false questions that I'm gonna be asking you guys um, and some kind of quotes that kind of, yeah, inspire me or kind of frame the way I think about my work. So to start with, I started today by saying I'm a parasitologist, but I wasn't always a parasitologist. I started out studying molecular biology. And this is one of my favorite quotes about molecular biology and saying that molecular biology takes all sorts of problems and is kind of able to solve them. Um, I like to think about molecular biology as a toolkit. And one of my favorite things to say coming from a love and a passion for mystery and thriller novels is that being a molecular biologist is like being a detective, but instead of a magnifying glass, you have a microscope. And instead of solving crimes, you're trying to understand life as we know it. So before I kind of went to university, I wanted to know a bit more about science and see if I was interested in it, if it was the right thing for me. So I did a couple of internships, one at the University of Malawi, which is where I'm from, and that is kind of my first introduction to parasitology. Um, I was in a lab uh, doing a few different experiments, and we were trying to basically create a way to take the lab into the field. So we're thinking of creative ways of how do we do experiments in the lab and then how do we do those experiments basically in the middle of nowhere when we don't have that equipment. After this, the second internship I did also in Malawi was with the Wellcome Trust and that's where I started learning about microbiology more generally and clinical biology. So I was doing some work um, on a clinical trial for a vaccine and then also processing some kind of hospital samples. So when people would come in and they had an unidentified infection, we would grow that infection in the lab and then diagnose these people. After this, I went to the University of Manchester, so that's UOM, and uh, for my undergraduate, I did a degree in molecular biology with a year in industry. I found the experience at Manchester to be amazing for several reasons. It was a really flexible course, so all of the life science degrees at Manchester kind of pick up modules from one pool and you just pick and choose what you're interested in. Um, this is great for someone like me who was still a little bit unsure exactly what I wanted to do. So I did all of my molecular biology basics and then picked to study things I was interested in like pharmacology and developmental biology. And all in all, I think it kind of gave me an excellent grounding or foundation that I've used as my career has progressed. The other reason I chose to go to Manchester was the year in industry. So being able to have the opportunity where you knew you were most likely to get a year of dedicated work experience, and that was really important for me. For my work experience, I chose to go to Oxford Biomedica, and they're a company that makes gene therapies, and they make gene therapies using viruses. So kind of quite topical, quite timely, um, if you're thinking about how the AstraZeneca vaccine works, that works as a viral gene therapy. And in fact, Oxford Biomedica does partner with AstraZeneca to produce the COVID vaccine. After my time in Manchester, I moved to Cambridge, that's UOC, and also was working at the Sanger Institute. So here I've been doing a master's degree and a PhD, which I'm just about to finish. 
This was kind of where I got introduced to the idea of computational biology. So not all biology that we do is kind of at the bench um, working with pipettes or test tubes. Some of it is using computers, uh, especially with the advent of DNA sequencing, which is what you can see in the picture um, on the slide. We now have a way of studying life using computers. So that is what I've been doing for the past five years is using computers to study biology, in particular bacteria and parasites that live inside the human body. So we now have our first kind of fact busting um, question of the day. Uh, I want to ask you, are we 100% human? Oh, okay. Flitting back and forth between true or false, but I think false is just about winning. So yeah, 70-30 split um, between true and false. So yeah, we're going with false. Amazing. You guys are all absolutely right. So false. For every human cell that we have in our body, scientists estimate that we have about one or three microbe cells in our body as well. So now that we know we're kind of covered in microbes, what type of microbes do you guys think we might find um, on or in people? So if you've got any ideas, you can pop them in the chat. So we've got microbes that digest our food. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, some vitamins, uh, you are not able to get them without uh, the bacteria in your gut that provide them. So things like vitamin K. We've got viruses. Yes, amazing. We do have viruses um, in our bodies. Yeah, parasites, bacteria, viruses. Excellent. So we've got almost all of them. The one that often gets forgotten is fungi. So in addition to viruses, parasites, bacteria, we have fungi. And these are all of the individuals that make up the gut microbiome. Um, it's incredibly diverse. There's so much to learn. It's a very kind of new field of biology. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of be at the forefront of research and science. Now, Going back to the idea that we're not 100% human, parasites are incredible organisms. And I'll go into a bit more detail about why that is, but they're very successful at kind of getting into the host and then kind of going around undetected um, because the worst thing for them is for the host to die. Now, the parasite that I study, I said its Latin name is Trichuris, um, or whipworms, and it is a massive problem. You've probably never heard of it, but there's about 400 million people that are affected by this parasite. This is why it's called a neglected tropical disease. So these are diseases that have incredible burden, they affect a large amount of the population, but oftentimes they go kind of understudied and underfunded. Um, so that was another reason why I wanted to work on this parasite, is to kind of get a better understanding of it and to kind of contribute to these efforts um, to combat it. So we have another fact busting time. Is the word helmins Greek for parasitic worm? Do you think that's true or false? Let's see if we can get a full 100% on this. So I think we need another few of you to vote. Again, if you can't vote, remember you can use the chat box to write your ideas as well. Okay, yeah, this one we've got 80-20 split um, for true. So yeah, you guys are amazing, absolutely right. This is true. This is why the study of parasitic worms can also be called helminthology. So what are parasitic worms? There are three kinds of worms. We call them flatworms, thorny-headed worms, and roundworms. 
Now the flatworm you've most likely heard of is probably tapeworms. So that's the gory tales that people like to tell of worms that were in someone's intestines and were many, many feet long. Uh, the other worms that we have are these thorny headed worms. These worms, we tend not to think about them because they don't um, infect people. They often infect uh, plants or um, animals or they live in the sea. And then lastly, we have round worms which are also called nematodes. And this is the group that whipworms are in. So instead of being flat or instead of having a spiky head, these worms are round. Now, roundworms are kind of quite unique in that they all undergo the same life cycle. So it starts out over here. And the first thing we do is we're gonna create a larva or a baby worm. After this, the larva hatches out of the egg and the way that these worms grow, instead of just getting bigger and bigger slowly, they get bigger at four specific time points. And when they do this, they shed their entire skin and then grow a new one that is big enough for their new size. They do this four times and then we consider them adults. They reproduce, they lay more eggs, and that kind of completes the life cycle. Now, Whipworms, they do undergo this life cycle, but where are the different stages happening when they're causing an infection? So the eggs are often found in food and water. Um, this is because uh, if you're in an area with poor water sanitation or hygiene, that means it might be contaminated with um, things like feces from people and animals. So when people drink unclean water or eat food that they haven't quite washed properly, the eggs go into the intestines. Now, when the eggs are in the intestines, they're able to detect that this is a great environment for them to be in. They kind of go, yep, yeah, amazing, I have found my home. And if you think of your intestine as kind of a long tube, um, this diagram that we've got over here, and in the tube, there are these dips or pits that we call crypts. And it's when they're inside these dips that the worms invade your intestines and basically set up shop for life. And so this is where they do the reproduction and they lay more eggs and then the eggs are passed out in feces. Now, when people are infected with whipworms, they can have two kinds of infection. We call them chronic and acute. Chronic is sort of a lifelong infection where you just kind of consistently have low levels of worms. Acute infections are more severe. It's where you get a massive infection with a large number of worms and that can cause quite serious illness. In adults, for the most part, having worms, you can kind of get by, but in children, when they have a parasitic worm infection, it often means they start experiencing um, some malnutrition and then because of that, they might experience some developmental delays. So it's a really important disease to make sure we um, get rid of it um, in children under five. So now we have another fact busting time. Is having a parasite always a bad thing? And does it mean that you will get sick? Just need a few more of you to vote and we've got a hundred percent. Again, if you can't pop it in the, if you can't see the, the voting panel, put your ideas into the chat. That's pretty good. We've got most people there. Yeah, amazing. So yeah, false just about winning. We've got a 60-30 split. And once again, you guys are doing a great job. That's absolutely right. Sometimes having a parasite is not a bad thing. And actually we think we might be able to use parasites to cure some diseases in the future. So what do I mean by this? On one side, studying whipworms, we want to prevent disease. We've talked about how bad it is for children to have this parasite. And it's important that we um, reduce the burden of this disease. But on the other side, these parasites might be able to do us a lot of good. Uh, some people have these conditions which are called autoimmune diseases. 
basically the immune system has got a little bit confused and instead of doing the things like producing a fever when it um, encounters things like viruses or bacteria, it will be having those responses um, just to the cells within the body or to things that it shouldn't be having those responses to, like food items, um, so gluten in celiac disease, for example, um, and then random food items in uh, the irritable bowel diseases or irritable bowel syndrome. And what we think we'll be able to do with these parasites is give them to people with these autoimmune conditions and it gives the immune system something to do. So it stops attacking uh, your body and will kind of focus on the parasite. The other thing we might uh, think we'll be able to do with parasites is the parasites themselves produce these chemicals and molecules that are able to calm the immune system down. So we think either the parasites themselves or the molecules they'll produce will be able to help us with these type of diseases. But we're in a bit of a conundrum. We know these parasites can do these things, but currently we can't actually grow these parasites in the lab. It can be a bit difficult to get a hand on them. And that is why I am studying the topic that I'm studying in my PhD. I think that if we know how to hatch these parasites, we'll be able to do more with them. We'll be able to keep them in the lab, make more parasites and make them in a controlled way so that we can actually give them to people as therapies. So what exactly is hatching? What happens when roundworms hatch? Hatching is a multi-stage process and it's very tightly regulated. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail um, later, but even just having whipworms that infect three different animals, they have different requirements uh, to be able to hatch them. So the first step in hatching is what we call induction, and that can be by internal or external factors. Uh, normally it's external factors, and this includes things like the host bacteria and different molecules that you can kind of create chemically to mimic the things that the bacteria are producing. After the larvae have been induced when they're in the eggs, the next thing you notice is a change in behavior. So they get activated, they start wriggling around, and a lot of them have this sharp tongue, the Latin name for that is a stilet, and they use that to cut through the eggshell. Uh, they also secrete enzymes, so they use this to degrade the eggshell as well, and this results in them exiting, swimming out, and kind of free to infect. So what does hatching actually look like? Uh, this is a video of some hatching that I took when I was in the lab. So we've got one egg over here that hasn't hatched yet, but the one in the middle, the little worm is kind of making its way out of its eggshell. Um, it does take a little bit of effort for these worms, but eventually it kind of gets out and is on its way. There we go. So this is what I spend a lot of time um, looking for when I'm looking down the microscope, is seeing how can we make these hatch, or in some cases, how can I add something to this to stop hatching happening? So I mentioned that I am studying whipworms in three animals. I've got the Latin names for them here, T. murus, T. suis, and T. tricura. T. murus is the mouse whipworm. It infects rodents. And this whipworm, we kind of have a really good understanding of it and we can grow it in the lab. Unfortunately, it doesn't infect people, so we won't be able to actually use it for treatments in the future. But it's a good starting point to understand uh, generally what happens in whipworms and what sort of things we might need to um, induce hatching in them. The next one we have is T. suis. This is the pig whipworm. Now we know a little bit um, about some of the factors that induce hatching, but we don't know as much as we do in the mouse whipworm. The other thing is that it's grown in pigs. So unless you have a kind of research facility that's able to have pigs, it can be quite hard to study this whipworm. In fact, when I wanted to do work with this whipworm, I went to Denmark because they have the biggest pig economy in Europe. Um, so there was lots of samples for me to work on there. 
Um, the other thing that is good about the pigwit worm is that it can be used in people. It has the same effect on the immune system as the human whipworm, but it doesn't establish a chronic infection. So that's quite attractive if you could give people this parasite and they will get all of the benefits of calming their immune system, but they're able to get rid of it. They won't be um, infected long term. And then lastly, we have the human whipworm, Tetrakira. This one infects humans. Now this is very difficult. We don't know anything about what causes hatching in this whipworm. And it's also quite difficult to collect samples. For the most part, you have to go to places where people are infected. And this is normally in the tropics and subtropics. So Central and South America, Africa and Asia. So quite a long way to go for research. Um, but otherwise you kind of yeah, we're looking for ways to make this more accessible. I'm very fortunate in that I have a collaborator. He has an autoimmune disorder and he was intrigued about the possibility of whipworms helping his autoimmune disorder. So he infected himself with the whipworm and I'm able to collect samples from him. Um, he also lives in Denmark. So that was another reason why I went to Denmark. But now that we've met the kind of three main worms, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the specific work I do with each of them. So I mentioned that the mouse whip worm can be grown in the lab. This is what I'm doing here. I have a mouse gut. I've dissected it. And then I'm going to start pulling out all of the little individual worms, put the worms in this culture dish. And this is where they lay the eggs. And then we can use either these living worms or these eggs um, to study different chemicals and their effects on the whipworm or the effects on the eggs of the whipworm. We can also study how it affects mice and see how long it takes mice to kind of get better from infections um, by giving them different drugs, etc. The other thing that we found when studying uh, the kind of mouse whipworm is that bacteria are essential to induce hatching in whipworms. So we have some electron microscopy that I took here. And this is the, these big things are the whipworm eggs. The little things are the bacteria. And there you can see at the top, that is where the worm will have swum out. And we have a nice picture down here at the bottom where you can see the bacteria specifically stick to this part of the egg and that part of the egg dissolves and then the worm is able to swim out. So this is incredibly encouraging. Um, we are like, great, we know it's bacteria, we know we need them, but we had no idea exactly which bacteria are important. So in this case, it's, I'm using E. coli, but when we try to use E. coli with the pig whipworm and the human whipworm, it didn't work. So we said, OK, we've got to go back to where the bacteria live and start collecting samples from the guts of these animals and the guts of some people. So collecting samples from the guts of people. Do you think stool samples are a good representation of all of the bacteria that live in the human gut? No, oh, it's very close now. We need to yeah. we need a few more people <laughs> just to see if they may it, it tips it one way or the other. Lots of deliberation going on. Anyone else? Anyone else? Last one. Anyone? Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> so this time we've gone for true. Unfortunately, you guys, this is the one where I've got you. That is false. Different bacteria live in different part of the gut, um, but stool samples are just the most convenient sample that we can get from people. And they provide us with quite a lot of information, but they don't provide us with all of the information. And I'll talk a bit about why that is. So if you think about the gut, you often think of like the small intestine, large intestine, the stomach, and yep, all of those um, areas have their own populations of bacteria that live in them, but it gets even narrower when we're talking about worms. 
So like I said, your gut is kind of a hollow tube and we've separated the gut into two fractions, one which we call the lumen fraction. So everything that's passing through. So essentially all of the stool samples and then the mucosa fraction. So these are the bacteria that live really close to the walls of the intestine. So the image I showed you earlier, this is what the crypts look like, but this is probably a little bit more accurate. You have the cells of the intestine, and then you have a layer of mucus protecting them, and then you have all of the material that passes through your gut. And the worms actually like this mucus layer. That is what they're attracted to when they're trying to infect people. So we started thinking, um, are we getting the best um, samples from stool samples and kind of decided no. So we started looking at samples from the mucus. So I have a video of me collecting some mucus from the gut of a pig. I will warn you, this gut is significantly larger and a little bit gross, so hopefully no one is too squeamish. But yeah, so here we have the gut. I've collected some stool samples, and then now I'm scraping the intestines with the little red scraper to collect all of the mucus. And then I'm culturing those bacteria that are in the mucus on some plates. And also freezing some for some sequencing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then also adding it to the eggs from the pig whip worm to try and see if these samples can cause hatching. And yes, they do. We found out that whipworms prefer bacteria that come from the mucus rather than bacteria that come from stool samples. Um, so that was incredibly interesting to learn about. Now, I can't really do that with people. People don't really want me to take their intestines. Um, so when we wanted to test this in people, we had to get a little bit more creative and we were able to partner with a gastroenterologist her, who collected some teeny tiny biopsies from the colons of people. And then we're able to test those biopsies with um, the human whipworm. Now, obviously I don't have a video of um, someone undergoing a colon biopsy to show you. So why are we doing this? This is because we want to refine the way that we um, create models for hatching. So currently we're like using stool samples. Um, this process is called fecal microbiota transplant. When you take a stool sample and either pass it to another individual or a lab animal to try and get the benefits of the bacteria contained in that stool. Now, obviously, that tends to get quite a uh, reaction from people. Um, and honestly, going forward, if we want to uh, use these bacteria to create worms in a way where we're going to give them to people, it is definitely something we need to move away from. So we're doing all of this work to try and characterize the bacteria that are in store so we can move to a system where we just grow specific strains of bacteria give them uh, to mice, and then we're able to put our whipworm in these mice and it will hatch because it has the right environment, the right bacteria are there. And then we'll be able to produce some whipworms in a way where we say, we took the whipworm eggs from here, we exposed them exactly to this bacteria in this kind of mouse, and this is how these worms were produced. Um, here is your worm therapy for your autoimmune disorder. So that is why we're we doing what we're doing on the lab side. Now I've talked about growing bacteria. Do you think we can study bacteria even if we can't grow them in the lab? Awesome. One clear winner here, isn't there? Yeah, amazing. So yeah, I've got 90% of us going for true. That is absolutely right, excellent work. So we have a type of computational biology called metagenomics, and this is how we can study bacteria even when we can't grow them. Got a slightly wordy quote, but 
one of my favorites that is very excited about metagenomics, about as excited as I am, because it really has opened up a whole new world of ways to study microbes and the communities that they exist in and understand how they interact with one another and us, seeing as we're colonized by so many of them. So what is metagenomics? How do we go from stool samples to meaningful data? The first thing we'll do is extract the DNA. After this, we will sequence them um, using a variety of sequencing platforms, but the one I normally use is Illumina or short read sequencing. After this, there's two ways we can analyze them. The kind of preferred way to analyze them is using a reference. So using the genomes of bacteria that we already know to try and help us piece the puzzle together of the genomes that are in our samples. But sometimes um, these bacteria, we haven't sequenced them before. We don't necessarily know what they are. So in this case, we have to analyze them and use this sample to create a reference. Um, this is significantly more difficult if you think about it like doing a puzzle. This is like doing a puzzle when you have the box with the image on it. This is like doing a puzzle if someone just gives you a Ziploc bag of puzzle pieces and asks you to figure it out. Um, but with the computing power that we have available to us today, uh, this is actually possible. So very exciting advance. But now that we have all of this genetic information, what are we doing with it? How do we actually look for differences? There's two types of analysis that we can do. Um, one which we call taxonomic analysis, which essentially tells us who is in the community. It gives us an identity um, for these bacteria, tells us what species and what genus they are. Uh, that's not always possible. Sometimes you don't have the entire genome for um, a species in your sample. So what you can do is use those fragments of that genome to do functional analysis. So this is looking for what proteins um, these fragments of DNA encode for and what they might be doing. Um, so I have some images here. In my work, I'm looking for bacteria that express specific types of enzymes. So when I find a fragment that I think might be um, an interesting enzyme gene from a particular um, bacteria, then I can go and do things like predict the structure of this gene. Um, so this tells me that yes, it does have the structure of the family of enzymes I'm interested in. And it even goes so far as to tell me where the active site is and what type of things might be binding to this enzyme. So between the two of them, you can kind of get a good idea um, of yeah, who's in the community and what functions these bacteria are doing. So. While I'm just one woman here in front of you today, by no means is this a one woman show. I've been supported and helped by lots of lovely people whose names are on the slide. Um, and so yeah, always grateful. And honestly, it's one of the best things about working in science is getting to hang out with and interact with some really cool people. Now, lastly, um, I have some, some things and resources. Um, if you want to kind of get more involved in science, uh, learn a few more things. Uh, the first thing is the Franklin Society essay competition. So at my college here in Cambridge, Murray Edwards, uh, we run an annual competition to allow six formers to explore scientific topics that are beyond the syllabus. There are prizes for first, second and third place essays. First prize wins 50 pounds. Um, so we have that link there where you can go to our website, um, look at the different essay topics we have this year. And yeah, it will be really great to see some of your submissions. Um, so yeah, please write away. The next thing I have is meet more microbiologists. Thank you so much for coming today to meet me. There are hundreds of other people like me. Um, last year, we started Black in Microbiology to kind of amplify the voices of microbiologists that you maybe don't hear from as often. 
as part of this, we had some panel discussions uh, with people representing all of the different ologies that fall under microbiology. So people from bacteriology, parasitology, virology, and all of these panel discussions are on our YouTube channel. So you can watch them and learn from and hear from more scientists. Um, if you're on Twitter, our Twitter handle is black and micro. So follow us for any future um, events we might be doing. And then lastly, we have a comic book about worms. Yes, that definitely exists. Um, so one of the things that my boss has been doing to kind of educate the people most affected by whipworms about whipworms is developing this worm hunters program. Um, so this is a program that seeks to go out into endemic regions, do some engagement with the communities, teach them about whipworms, how to avoid getting sick, and about the research that we're doing uh, with whipworms, um, all while enjoying some really cool graphic design. So if you go to the Worm Hunters website, you can learn a little bit more about the project and the work that we're doing. There's also a link to download the comic, and that has some kind of really fun, lighthearted activities to do. So with that, I will just say, Thank you all very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed that. And we now have some time for Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you so much to Poker. That was so interesting. We love a little bit of uh, grossness as well. So all those wiggly worms are fabulous. <laughs> um, so <laughs> is there anyone who's got any questions that would like to ask? <laughs> love it, Denial. Um, any experiments that have gone horribly wrong? Yes, absolutely. I think that <laughs> that is part and parcel um, of science. I had one experiment where I was so keen to preserve the samples. Um, I, it was an experiment that was running for about eight weeks. And before I even started, I said, every time I collect my weekly samples, I'm going to freeze them at minus 80 degrees and kind of preserve them in the best way possible. But when I came to those samples and I wanted to extract my RNA, it turned Turns out freezing them isn't the best way to preserve those samples and I had a really hard time um, trying to get RNA out of these samples and was very worried that I was going to have to repeat that eight week or two month experiment all over again um, but in the end I, I got enough to get the information I wanted out of that experiment but yeah sometimes things go wrong and it takes a while to find out that they have. <laughs> Great. We've got um, got one from Polly. Um, how much travel have you done with this apart from Denmark? Um, apart from Denmark, not as much as I wanted to. Uh, we thought we were going to be able to do the Worm Hunters project um, in another country. There were some talks of maybe Indonesia or China, so I was, I was very <laughs> into that. Um, so unfortunately, haven't been able to do any other field trips other than the Denmark one. Um, but I was able to go to a conference in Greece. That was really nice. Um, all conferences this year got cancelled, last year rather, got cancelled. Um, so I've been, yeah, in, in the lab in Cambridge for quite a while now. But in normal times, you probably would have gone to a lot more sampling sites, wouldn't you? But obviously pandemic um, sort of sort of squashed that quite significantly didn't it yeah exactly um we had some plans for me to either redo some work um or work with different collaborators but that just hasn't panned out brilliant um ewan asks how would you know if you were infected with a whipworm or would you not know you probably wouldn't know unless you have some kind of microscope at home. So the way we tend to look for parasite infection is actually just looking for eggs in um, store from people or animals. Um, it's pretty easy. You just have a glass slide, take a bit of poo and smush it along and then look under the microscope. Um, and if someone is infected, they will have parasite eggs. It's pretty easy to see them. So unless you have a microscope, you probably won't know. <laughs> With, with perhaps children in some of them that sort of more developed um, countries, do they get, could they get like seriously affected? Like, do they get like really high parasite lo um, loads because they're not, they're not getting treated? And can that then 
be detrimental, seriously detrimental to their health? So they tend not to get very high parasite loads. Um, this is another kind of really cool feature of the parasites is in addition to kind of signaling to the immune system to try and ignore them, um, they're also able to signal to each other to try and prevent getting a catastrophic worm burden because obviously that's the worst thing for the parasite if the host dies the parasite doesn't have anywhere to live anymore so it's more this kind of chronic um, infection like long-term infection that has the detrimental effect because it's someone who's continuously um, drawing nutrients um, from children who kind of need ev all the nutrients from everything that they're eating. Brilliant. Um, and Rita asks, uh, very interesting talk to poker. How far do you want to go um, with studying these worms? Are you hoping to study them beyond the PhD? Oh, <laughs> tough question. Um, I would love to kind of stay in worms. Um, I'm definitely going to stay in parasites. Um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting project. I think it needs a little bit more work, maybe a couple of other PhD students before we get to the side that I'm kind of more interested in, which is like commercializing or um, applying things that we've learned from these parasites um, in health situations. We are starting to see some clinical trials doing controlled infections um, of people with different worms, nothing in Trichuris yet, but another roundworm called hookworm. There's quite a lot of trials um, um, being studied uh, with that parasite so I probably will try and veer back but once it's a little bit further along probably in trial stage or in stage where we're thinking of moving it to market. Because that actually brings us on to so what so once you've done a PhD what what are the next steps for someone who has completed a PhD do you generally stay where you've done your PhD or are, are you encouraged to to move move to different places to get different experiences what 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 is the sort of the next stage of the career journey hmm. I would say um Honestly, my, my main advice is always just follow your curiosity. Um, if you want to stay where you are, if there's great projects going on, stay where you are. If you want to go somewhere new, go somewhere new. Um, the best things happen to you when you're just following things that you're interested in. Um, I think sometimes you do get hung up on what is kind of the right career move. Uh, for me personally, I'm not even just applying to jobs in science. I'm applying to some jobs in science, uh, some jobs in the corporate world, because I'm also really interested in how science becomes medicines um, and uh, items that are actually sold and used by people. So yeah, follow, follow your curiosity um, and that will give you kind of the best trajectory. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point, because a lot of research at, at Sanger and, and other research organisations is now, um, what's the word, it's getting translated, isn't it, into real life applications. And in some ways that can actually be um, commercialised, so turned into, into businesses. So is it good to have a business head as well as a science head, I guess? Absolutely. Um, and I I think, yeah, just getting involved so many places now have all sorts of kind of entrepreneurship or consulting clubs where you get to learn about how products actually become viable businesses. Um, and so you can go to these things and kind of get these frameworks and things that you need to think of if you're like, I have an idea and I want this to actually be realized and help people um yeah chances are a lot of a lot of schools and universities now do these sort of entrepreneurship clubs so definitely get involved in entrepreneurship brilliant um polly's also asked um when you were talking about neglected tropical diseases how could you could we find out more about those kinds of diseases so are there any good resources out there that you could possibly recommend or read good reading sources yeah, absolutely. Um, the CDC website has a massive section on all of these. Um, so if you go on the CDC website and if you just look up either neglected tropical diseases, that kind of gives you all of them. If you're interested in learning more about 
um, Trichuris or some of the other worms. Uh, these worms fall under a bracket called soil transmitted helminths. So you could also look for those. Um, and yeah, the CDC website has everything about kind of finding out how many people are infected, beautiful diagrams about the life cycle and how these parasites um, infect people. Um, and yeah, they've got all sorts of information about that. Yeah. I'll also do a cheeky plug for um, our website, yourgenome.org, which also has some um, nice pages on neglected tropical diseases as well. So CDC is amazing and you can get some really lovely microscopic images there as well. Um, so, yes. Um, so Emma's put in the chat the CDC link, but um, I've also put a your genome um, link with, to a story page that we've done about how we use genomics to tackle neglected tropical diseases as well. But there's a couple of other pages on there as well. Things like schistosomiasis, which is another quite um, serious um, neglected tropical disease, isn't it? Um, yeah. That's quite cool because it's got a, a snail as a vector, hasn't it? A water snail, which is... Yes. So that has a more complex life cycle where it's in people um, and snails and so schistosomes are one of the flat worms and the three types of worms I mentioned um, yeah also a really important disease to tackle definitely I've just find um, your genome has a, literally a page going what are helminths which will be really good sort of follow-up reading which I've just put in the chat as well um, brilliant so um, are there any more questions coming in from our viewers? If not, I've got a couple of questions I might ask as well. Um, so obviously being a PhD, what is it like being a PhD student? I mean, it's quite an open question, but it's, <laughs> um, you know, are there, is it difficult to, to do? Do you get paid to be a PhD student? Because I get, we get off questions a lot, of, but if I do that, am I going to have to have another, another student loan that I've got to pay off and things like that? So yeah, what, what is it like? And would you recommend it? Um, I think I would recommend it if you find the right program for you. Um, so I'll go through some of the reasons why the Sanger program was the right program for me. Uh, first of all, yes, I do get paid. Um, you do get paid more or less depending on which program uh, you go to and they should have this salary information advertised up front um, so that is definitely um, important to look at and they pay you and kind of handle paying the university tuition and all of those type of things you don't have to worry about that depending on what program you go on to. Uh, the second reason why the Sanger program was right for me was because we do a series of things called rotations. So while the PhD is four years long, for the first year of it, you go to three different labs, spend 10 weeks in that lab, learning about the lab, doing a small research project, and actually having a day-to-day -day working experience before committing to work with a group of people for three years, because it's not a lot of time and it's quite high pressure. So you want to make sure those three years are with the right people. So if there's a program that allows you to do some kind of rotations um, is definitely something I, I would recommend. Um, and then lastly, it's yeah about the research area and about your supervisor or your boss, the person who's going to be managing you. Um, do you enjoy the project? Um, try and find things outside of the project that motivate you. So I enjoy my project. I also enjoy that it has um, some implications for kind of global health. And I enjoy that it allows me to get involved in a lot of engagement and outreach. And that kind of is something that is able to still motivate me even when I'm having terrible awful days where I think I might lose eight weeks of work um, so that was really important for me and then also the people that you work with um, after doing my rotation I really enjoyed the people that I was working with and the lab so I was more than happy to say I'm coming back and doing the full three years with you guys brilliant fantastic um I'm always one nice one to to sort of to to sort of think about who is there anyone in particular that's in, inspired you to get into science or um has inspired you sort of in your journey so far oh that's a good one. Oh, I don't know there's like too many people to pick from <laughs> um let's see I'll go with kind of 
one of the first scientists where I was just like, you're such an epic person. Um, so Barbara McClintock, she studied uh, genetics in maize and discovered jumping genes or transposable elements. And I remember reading about her, reading about her work and how she kind of had to fight for equality and things like that in science. And I was just like, yep, yeah, like you're a cool person um, doing biology and molecular biology. Um, and that was fascinating to me. And of course, there have been many other scientists along the way that um, just add fuel to this fire of, there's so many cool people here, can I stay here? Brilliant, fantastic. Um, and I guess we'll finish on, what would be sort of your top tips for perhaps we've got, we've got some, oh, hang on, no, someone's popped a question in, so I won't, I won't talk that. Oh, here we go. Polly's asked also, were you particularly interested in biology at school or did you think you'd go in a different direction with other subjects? I was quite interested in biology. I did sort of hedge my bets where I just did all three sciences and math all the way throughout high school because um, I was like it could go either way. Um, but yeah, has generally always been it will be science of some sort. I'm not sure which one. Um, to kind of give an example of how long I've been uh, maybe a little bit annoying about science. Um, we used to have a chicken coop in my back garden and I got in a fight with the chickens because I got too close to the baby chickens. The mum chicken pecked at me and I went to my parents and said two things. A, I don't want the chickens anymore. And B, when the chickens are gone, can I have this chicken shed as my little science lab? Um, something that I'm actually interested in. Um, that didn't that didn't work. <laughs> but I've been interested in science ever since. Brilliant. Fantastic. So if we've got a range of students from year nine up to A level. So I guess what would be your top tips for, you know, people who are like like you as a youngster, interested in science, what would be your top tips to get them to perhaps go on to university to study science or, or specifically maybe even further along there? Yeah, I would say um, uh, as long as you're enjoying it, continue doing it, um, find ways to kind of feed your curiosity. And then also kind of if it's something you believe that it's for you and what you want to do, um, there are going to be have, there are going to be moments where you kind of have to persevere and uh, sort of yeah just kind of carry on with it. Um, I had some instances where I didn't do as well as I thought I would on exams and certain things, um, but. I was like, I want to be here. I know I'm good at science. I'm not the best exam taker. Um, but yeah, I just decided to power through and, and I'm still here. I'm still a scientist. Fantastic. Now, I think that's such a good message is like, don't be scared of failure because failure is, is a quite a, you know, a thing we have to do. You don't learn if you don't get things wrong. So, you yeah. know, and we can't all be aces at doing exams and there's other ways into science than just, just, you know exam 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 so yeah exactly fantastic well if there's no more questions we've had some cracking questions so thank you everyone who's been on the call today thank you so much to poker that was so interesting and yeah who doesn't love seeing an intestine with worms in i mean <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for having me it was, it was great to be here and chat to everyone brilliant so um yes yeah, so remember we we haven't got a um, black stem futures talk next week but we have got it the first and second week of may so please do join us for that and don't forget to go to the black stem futures blog to see what talks are coming up and um to register and also if you have enjoyed this talk and you are on the black stem futures program and would like to write a little mini article for the black stem futures blog about the talk and what you found interesting um then please do get in touch with us so otherwise thank you very much and have a great evening everyone mm -hmm.